Today, we have the great privilege of interviewing Lewis Gordon Pugh, who will be known to many of our members as a Mungo Park medalist and a fellow. We're just on the back of his award of an honorary doctorate from the University of Stirling, and I'm really pleased that he's uh, had the time to come and join us in our Explorers Room at our headquarters here in Perth. I can't wait to find out more about his swims in the North Pole, South Pole, and every other, every other ocean on Earth. There is a man they call the human polar bear. They also call him an oddity. No one really knows why he swims. Perhaps to be alone. Or maybe to prepare for the day that the sun melts the world. What does he know that others don't? Are there others that see the future as he sees it? And want to help him change it? Maybe he is an oddity, but I'm sure he doesn't mind what you call him, as long as it's not ordinary. Because ordinary won't change the world. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Really, really appreciate that. Thank um, you. And and it's been fantastic to watch what you've been doing over the last few years. I mean, we've followed it quite closely for must be at least a decade yes. um, and, and in awe of many of the things that you've got yeah. to, um, and very pleased to have you as a, a fellow and a medalist and a much Thank deserved you. medalist. So, yeah. so um, I've I got to start really first of all with the congratulations on your honorary doctorate from Stirling Thank uh, you. University, University of Stirling yes. yesterday. So um, obviously a fantastic moment. Um, it was. Yeah. yeah. So I th- how did you get on with that? So, I think because obviously the University of Stirling is doing a lot on on environmental science, but also it's the epicentre of swimming in Scotland, and a lot of the Olympic swimmers uh, train at the University of Stirling, so it just felt right to be there. And the surroundings in Stirling are just second to none. I mean, the campus is absolutely beautiful, amazing. I, yeah, no, it's a fabulous yeah. place, isn't yeah. it? So let's, uh, if we can, just ask some obvious questions about. Yeah. You know what really inspired your love of the ocean, right? Where mm. did that sort of stem from? Well, I, I grew up in Plymouth as a young boy, and I think if you grow up in Plymouth, you're always looking to the horizon. Uh, and from Plymouth, I moved out to Cape Town, and Cape Town's obviously a major, uh, also a major harbour. And my high school classroom looked out over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so I think there's that one aspect. So situationally, I was, you know, always next to the ocean. But also, you know, my father and mother both served in the Royal Navy. I grew up as a young boy listening to all the stories, put them together, and you get somebody who is passionate about oceans. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, and a daydreamer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I was a daydreamer, you know. I remember being in class at school, and there were three of us who sat next to each other, myself, a guy called Len John van der Waal, and a guy called Justin Strong. And all of us were always being constantly bollocked because we were looking out 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 to sea and Len John became a professional sailor Justin Strong became a world surfing amateur champion and uh, I became an endurance swimmer so I I think it's those dreams during the day and I I used to look out to sea uh, as a young boy and I just used to think 5,000 kilometers south of here is Antarctica and I want to go there yeah that's some thought actually you know and it took 18 years before I finally set foot on the continent. I always thought that one day I would go to Antarctica when I was a little boy, but I, you know, I never dreamt that it would be to swim. And I remember going down to the Ross Sea. And the Ross Sea, I mean, it's, it's a long journey to get down to the Ross Sea. So you sail from the bottom of New Zealand, you sail from 40 degrees south to 50, to 60, to 70. And eventually you see the amazing mountains of Victoria land and you carry on sailing until you get to 78 degrees south. And then you see a site which is just truly amazing. And it's those icy, an ice wall. It's like the White Cliffs of Dover, but it's pure ice of the Ross Ice Shelf. And there you're going to do your swim. (laughs) 
and it's uh, it, it's absolutely amazing to see this place. I mean, it sounds absolutely remarkable. So. Yeah. And obviously, it's been a dream of yours for so long. I mean, were you, were you sort of brought up in the traditions of yes. Antarctic explorers and Arctic explorers? I mean, who were your sort of inspirations around sure. some of this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly some of these polar explorers, Amundsen, Nansen, Shackleton, Scott, they were, you know, I learned about them at uh, at school and from my parents uh, reading history books to me. But but then there's the, the other aspect, you know, I went to the University of Cape Town in the early 1990s. A number of my lecturers were imprisoned fighting uh, against apartheid. Some of my fellow students were imprisoned uh, while we were at the university. And then it was the human rights campaigners, these people who fought for justice and equality. And I had the privilege of spending uh, quite a bit of time with Desmond Tutu, who won a Nobel Peace Prize. He then became the patron, uh, the first patron of my foundation. And I think it was these people, people who understood what the issue of the day was and were prepared to risk absolutely everything for it. So I think I got, you know, different, different, uh, yeah, uh, heroes. And I mean, that's heroines. an exceptional window on history, really. To mm, yes. And so, so how did that sort of affect you? That sort of that, that eyewitness sort of experience mm. of mm. human rights. Then, how did that sort of shape what you thought was possible? Perhaps. I, I started swimming in uh, the late nineteen eighties, and I started swimming around the world in various places, and I began to notice how the oceans were changing. And then there comes a moment where you have to make a decision. Are you going to stand up and talk about what you're seeing or are you going to keep quiet? And I felt at that moment that there was, that I needed to stand up and speak about it. Now the difficulty came was that I'm not a climate scientist. Okay, I, all I have is the experience of what I have seen. And over those years I had literally seen the, the oceans change. And I decided just simply to stand up and speak about the changes which I had seen, and speak about it from a point of justice. So for me, this was a, a, a fight for justice, a justice between ourselves, principally between ourselves and the animal kingdom. We've got absolutely no right to push animals into extinction. I think the world is very, very poor when we push animals into extinction, and equally also a fight of justice between ourselves and future generations. So that that's, was the, the lens through which all the campaigns started going through an issue of justice for me. So I didn't come at it from a, from a position of science. And then I tried to make all the campaigns as simple and as easy for ordinary people to understand. And so I always looked at things from the lens of a 12-year-old school child. Could they understand what I was talking about? And so, for example, in 2007 was the first really big swim. This was across the North Pole. And a very, very simple message. I'm swimming across a place which should be frozen over and has been frozen over for millennia. This place is changing. We cannot any longer deny what is happening in the Arctic and, what, and the impact it's going to have on all of us. Yeah, not very powerful. And, and you got there from a, a law background, a legal background. Yes. So obviously that's a big decision in it's, life to yeah. move away from a, a, a career as a lawyer. Yeah. How, did, how did you come about that and how, and how did yeah. it sort of shape you? Was that, was that a, a helpful background to have then when you walk into a sort of justice? Yes, background? it's a very, very helpful background because you're able to marshal your thoughts sequentially, able to argue with passion, not emotion. That's really important. So, you know, I want you to imagine you walk into a head of state's office or an environment minister's office when you've got 15 minutes you can't get emotional there you've got to go there with the facts explain what you're seeing why it matters to them and what the solutions are so law is a really really good background for that and i mean must have been a massive decision for you to then forego that yes it was i mean i was in my early 30s uh, I've been practicing law for some time. I was a maritime lawyer in London. I've got to be honest, <laughs> I was not a good lawyer. <laughs> and, and I say that because I think you need to be passionate about what you do in life. And, you know, I'd have these massive great contracts put in front of me and I would be sitting there pouring through them and, I'd, you know, 
I'd look at it and I'd ask myself, is this really important? And certainly for the ship owner or the cargo owner, this was an important matter. But it wasn't one of the defining issues of our generation. And, and having been through the University of Cape Town at that pivotal moment, and having seen people stand up and fight for what was really important, I found myself in my 30s asking myself, what am I doing here in London? Yes, you're earning a good salary, but is it really important? Are you making a difference? And so I went on a holiday to, uh, to Norway, to the, uh, to the top of Norway. And I cycled from Narvik all the way along the coast up to Lofoten. And I truly, I fell in love with the Norwegian coastline. And I went for a swim. I thought, you know, it was a really hot day and I was cycling along. I thought, let me just have a quick dip in here. And I jumped into the ocean and I could barely breathe. Uh, but I had done a swim around the most southern point of Africa, Cape Agulhas. And at that moment, I thought to myself, wow, uh, I wonder if I could swim around the most northern point of Norway. So a year later, I went to North Cape, Nordkap, and I swam around there. And then that lit up. And I remember finishing that swim and thinking to myself, Lewis, I wonder if you can go a little bit further north, which was the island of Spitsbergen. And then I swam there. And then suddenly, you know, I thought to myself, wow, I wonder if I can go even further north. I wonder if I can go to the North Pole. And then everything, all the training was to try and do this first swim across the North Pole, uh, which took place in 2007. Yeah, so a, a sort of very interesting sort of logic to that, um, in a way, although obviously swimming at the North Pole is actually mad. <laughs> well, you see, I think that I'm normal. I think the rest of the world is mad. And, and, and I say that because, you know, last year we obviously had the big climate summit here in Glasgow. I, uh, a couple of months beforehand in September, I was in Alula Sat in West Greenland. There that glacier now is moving at a speed of 40 meters per day in summer. And then I go to Glasgow and I'm, uh, and I'm at the summit and you're hearing people talking about the difference between a 1.5 degree rise in temperatures or a two degrees, and, you know, what's the difference between 1.5 and two degrees. It's significant. They don't seem to get to understand how serious the situation is and how quickly it is moving. So, you know, I think I'm normal, okay? I think, and I look around and I think, if we had taken action years ago when the scientists were telling us that these changes were occurring, we'd be in a very, very different situation right now. And the longer we delay it, the worse the situation becomes. Absolutely. So you've mentioned COP. Yeah. I can't help then asking, you know, did it achieve very much and why not? Are we looking for leadership in the wrong places? I th think? Yeah, I think we are probably looking for leadership in the wrong places. I mean, I want you to imagine trying to get agreement with 196 nations. So I was involved in trying to get uh, the Ross Sea protected. There, that's 25 nations plus the EU. And it's very, very difficult to get agreement with 25 nations. Try 196, it's almost impossible. Yeah. So I think trying to look to states to try and solve this problem is very, very difficult. Yes, we definitely need the leadership from politicians. But I think it's the, the, most of the changes are going to come from civil society and from businesses. And businesses have to respond. They respond to you know consumer or client demand. And if you're keeping on demanding that, then if, if companies if companies don't change, you can change who you're doing business with like that. Yeah. So they have to respond a lot quicker. And then in terms of civil society, I mean, I, 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 it was interesting because I, I, I did the march uh, with the youth outside that summit, there is a deep, deep passion in the youth now to solve this crisis. And it was, it was wonderful to see that. But that needs to be channeled in the right way. And, and maybe do we need to do more to, we, you know, to wake up to that, to realize that and to respond to that? Because most of the youth aren't, you know, are too young to make that change, obviously. So. Yeah, I mean, they don't, they don't have access to the power you know, I think it was only when I was probably in my mid 40s that I felt competent to properly walk into a head of state office 
and hold that person accountable and actually be able to deliver on on on, on various things which I was trying to achieve. So it takes years to become a, a decent diplomat. And you know the youth argue with passion and with with on, on justice grounds and but it's hard. It's really hard. You know, heads of state and environment ministers, they're incredibly busy. You see this right now. You just start thinking if you're head of state now, all the different issues you're dealing with, climate is just one of many of them. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Yes. I know that I think that's why I think that's why some of the cops end up being disappointing because there are two or three where there wasn't as much other noise. Yeah. Copenhagen was a bit like that. Yes. Paris was a bit like that. To yeah. some extent Glasgow. So do you think COP twenty seven in Egypt is going to be overshadowed by Ukraine and cost of living crisis, or do you think there's an opportunity to move the dial further forward again? Well, I think there is an opportunity in, in, in COP27. Uh, so COP27 is going to be in Egypt, it's going to be in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, on the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is home to some of the most incredible coral reefs in the world. Right? So in Glasgow, Glasgow is a great city, but it's not next to the scene of the crime. And I think what we can do in Sharm el-Sheikh is actually take world leaders and show them some of these coral reefs. Because I think when you see these coral reefs, you'll see this amazing ecosystem. Right? And I want to take leaders there, I want to show them it. And the science is really, really clear now. If we heat our planet by 1.5 degrees, over 70% of the world's coral reefs die. Over two degrees and 99% of the world's coral reefs die. They need to understand the consequences of their delay and the consequences of a 1.5 or a 2 degree world. And, you know, currently we're on track for at least 2.3 degrees. You imagine a world without coral reefs. Yeah. I'm not prepared to do that. So that idea of giving people that first-hand experience, is, oh. um, I think is very powerful. Sure. Um, I, just for your amusement, I was told by the Icelandic Prime Minister, President, sorry, that he, he was laying some claim for the Paris Agreement. Right. Because the French Prime Minister visited Iceland. Okay. And yes. insisted on seeing a glacier. Yes. So the President landed the helicopter where the glacier was when he was born. Yes. And made the entire delegation walk to where the glacier was now. <laughs> right. It was 45 minutes up the glen. Yeah. And everybody arrived hot and sweaty and bothered. But but he'd made his point. No, I think that's a very, very simple way of, of, of carrying a message. It's really, really powerful. Uh, I mean, you think of some of the great big national parks in America, which were... Uh, I think it was Theodore Roosevelt who, who declared them and it was a John Muir who had taken him to these areas and said we need to protect these last great wilderness areas in America. Uh, we're visual creatures, we're, you know, when you take somebody and you show them, then they understand. No amount of science and data and number is going to persuade uh, some of these leaders about the importance of protecting these places. And when you put your head underneath you know the waves in Sharm el Sheikh it is amazing because above the water it's just hot hot sandy desert nothing put your head underneath and it's beautiful tropical fish these gold gold fish and the yellows and the blues and manta rays and sharks and turtles it's amazing the idea that we could lose this is yeah it's unthinkable yeah absolutely but yeah, no, that's lovely, and and that sort of sense of beauty below the surface, absolutely. Yeah, I, I feel that I have to ask you this yeah. because of your legal background, obviously, this passion for justice and and environmental um, sustainability. There is there one of the people we interviewed was Giorgio Meta, who runs Stop Ecocide, which is yeah. trying to create an international law of environmental rights, effectively. Yes. Um, in the in the international framework of laws. Yes. Is there is that part of what's been missing, that sort of um, formal protection or value of nature? Is that part of what we've got wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think that that will be an important step. But, I mean, you, you look at what's happening in the Ukraine right now. You've got, you know, genocide occurring, right? You've got human rights being grossly abused. You've got laws of war being broken on a daily basis. 
You can have as much law as you want, but ultimately you need to persuade people that this is the right thing to do. Obviously, you've done some incredible swims. Yeah. Um, most, you've mentioned the North Pole already. Yeah. I mean, was that, is that the coldest swim you've done? I understood in one of your mm. swims your tongue froze. Or no, no, I've done even colder. So the water at the North Pole is minus 1.7. So salt water freezes at minus 1.8. I did a swim down in Antarctica off the Ross Sea where it was even colder. So the water was minus 1.7, but the air temperature was minus 27. I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. And water is a fascinating substance. So fresh water at sea level between 0 and 100, it's obviously a liquid. Above 100 becomes a gas. Below 0 becomes a solid so it's actually a tipping point at which everything changes and when you get into water below zero poof. you mean there are a lot of people now when i started cold water swimming very very few people had ever swum anywhere close to zero there are a lot of people now who've done swims below zero i'm still the only person that swum in water which is minus 1.7 okay and the difference between zero and minus 1.7 is literally the difference between doing a climb up Ben Nevis and going up K2 in winter. It's exponential that. And so swimming in water, which was minus 1.7, air temperature minus 27, I pull my hand out the water and you're taking it from minus 1.7 into minus 27. Waves were crashing up against the side of the boat, coming up and then turning into slush mid-air. It's a very, very, it's a high consequence environment. Yeah, I believe you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't sound very appealing. No, and it, and, it, and it wasn't. And it wasn't. And remarkable feat, really. Yes. I mean, did you, if you had to deal with other things um, like wildlife and, you know, yeah. you know, orcas or anything to worry about, or does this not really cross your mind? Well, I, I remember during that swim in, in, in the Ross Sea, you know, shortly before I was going to get in the water, I asked my wife to get in a small zodiac and go up and down, up and down where I was going to do the swim, just, just to make sure that there were no leopard seals in the water, no orcas. I mean, you've got to know that when you're at 78 degrees south, you can you can be sure that those leopard seals have not seen a, a human swimming in those waters before. And so there's, there's always going to be a, uh, you know, they're very inquisitive animals. And on that swim, I had done a swim in uh, a little island en route uh, called Campbell Island. And I got pulled out the water because a fur seal came for me. And it's, it's a frightening experience when a really big animal comes for you. Because you know that that animal can inflict damage in a serious, quick way. Yeah. You know, and leopard seals are these extraordinary animals. They've got this this split personality. One moment they, you know, want to kill a, a penguin and come and put it in front of you as a gift, and then the next moment they want to grab your leg and pull you straight down to the bottom of the ocean, and you don't know what type of day they're having, <laughs> right? So they are, you know, I don't want to swim near leopard seals, and and they are the most extraordinary animal. So you can be in a small boat going next next to an, a, uh, a piece of ice and they're lying on that piece of ice and you go past them and they just lift up their head and they let out a sound which is blood curdling. It's like a... It's like a monitor lizard and you know you're not going to get in that water. So, yeah, I mean, I've swum with with leopard seals. I, I did a swim in Antarctica where I went past a, a polar bear. I've, I've, I've swum, uh, you know, my, my main training ground is, is, is South Africa and certainly swum over, over great white sharks. And sharks are incredible animals to swim past because, you know, that first moment you see it, it's just like, oh no, and that absolute fear and you want to roll up into a little ball. And then you see the way they move. And they are just the most graceful, beautiful animal. And you almost, there's almost a magnetism that you want to actually follow them. But you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are really, really beautiful, beautiful apex predators. I mean, you must have had a lot of moments with yeah. wildlife in the yes. oceans. I mean, are there, what are the sort of standout 
you know, memories for you? What are the sort of privileges mm. where you just thought? Can, can I tell you, it wasn't actually in the ocean, it was actually in a river. And it was two weeks ago, I went to the source of the Hudson. And the source of the Hudson is Upper State New York, it's in the Adirondack Mountains. Okay? And you, you imagine New York. I mean, everyone, you know what New York's like these massive, great skyscrapers, you know, millions and millions of people bustling, busy. The, it is an amazing city. You go 500 kilometers up that river. And there are forests on either side. There are be- thick, thick forests. There are bears in the forest. There are big turkey vultures, you know, uh, flying overhead, circling overhead. And I was swimming down this river, and it was clean, and it was fresh, and it was pure, just as rivers should be. And I swam past a beaver. And this beaver came f- towards me, and... Uh, it almost looked like a crocodile coming towards me. And as she came towards me, she was slapping her tail. She was obviously trying to get me away from, from her young. And it was just beautiful. You know, that's what rivers should be like. Yeah. They should be clean, they should be fresh, they should be drinkable, swimmable, and fishable. You know. And so I think that was you know, the most recent standout moment about what our rivers should be like. And then you come to the United Kingdom and you realize, you know, we have water companies here now pouring raw sewerage into our rivers. It's criminal. And governments are failing to hold them to account and paying up massive amounts to their shareholders. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're just, just so disrespectful, it's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. And Obviously, an awful lot of the things you've done, um, I think you've, you know, I, we view as courageous. Um, yeah. I don't know how you would view them, <laughs> um, but they are courageous. You, you've described sort of courage as a, a muscle that needs mm-hmm. to be exercised, is that right? I mean, you've yeah. obviously had moments, you must have had moments of self-doubt yeah. on some of these swims. Courage is an interesting thing. I mean, in English, we, 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 we use the word courage and bravery as if they are synonymous, but they're not. You know, bravery comes from the Italian word bravado. Courage comes from the word, uh, from the French word meaning heart. And it's about following your heart. And, you know, I'm doing these swims and I'm, I'm following what's deep down inside me. And yes, I do believe that courage is a muscle. You've got to be exercising it on a regular basis. If I don't swim in the waters of Cape Town on a regular basis, and get in there early in the morning, and you know there is a risk, small as it may be, that a great white shark is going to come up next to you. I can assure you that if you're not doing that on a daily basis or swimming in really, really rough conditions, where you're right on the edge of safety, when you get down to Antarctica and the water's minus 1.7 and you've got a leopard seal in the water and you've got the wind howling off a glacier, you just won't have what it takes to, uh, to be able to do the swim. The last aspect of courage is that courage is contagious. It really is. And, and equally, uh, fear is contagious. So if I see anybody in the team who, who looks frightened, it just ripples through me. So I try to choose people who are courageous. And so on all my expeditions, I always take somebody who I know that I will never, ever give up in front of. Okay. Yeah. It's the last really big swim which I did, which was down in Antarctica, where I went down a, a subglacial uh, river. I remember the images. Yeah. I mean, it's really, really frightening. So I want you to imagine uh, arriving in Antarctica and on, this, on, the, on the surface of the ice, you see all these supraglacial lakes, all these lakes are appearing on top, meltwater because of the climate crisis. Thousands and thousands of them. And then some of them go down little cracks and then they drop all the way down to the bottom of the ice sheet, lubricated, and that's what makes it makes it unstable. And we found one of these tunnels, and we could see that this tunnel went underneath this, this big mountain of ice and came out the other side. And then how can I convey a message about the melting of the Arctic in a better way than actually swimming down one of these tunnels? <laughs> but, but it's, as I say, it's a very high consequence environment. And the reason for that is because you don't want to swim underneath ice because ice can fall. I had taken with me a man called Slava Fetisov, 
who is the captain of the Soviet ice hockey team, had won two Olympic gold medals. I said, Slava, you go to the end of that thing. And I stood on the one side. And then through the walkie-talkie, he said, OK, get ready. And I went for it. And I'll never, ever forget entering that tunnel because the colors were just so amazing. It was this beautiful light, light blue. And as you go further down a tunnel, then it becomes a dark blue and then a violet and then an indigo. And then it went completely black. I carried on. And as I was going through the tunnel, I heard this most almighty crack because the ice is moving. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a tunnel, even a small little movement of the ice just... I mean, it sounds like, like a thunderclap. And I just put my head down and I just swam as fast as I could. And there was Slava at the end. It is important to surround yourself with people who are courageous. You lift yourself up to their levels. Wow, yeah. That doesn't bear thinking about how scary mm. <laughs> that is, actually. However, what it has done is it's touched on... I, I love the way you sort of pointed out the, the etymology of the words. And, and I think words are quite important to you so there's a couple I was going yeah, go to try you with actually because I think they are words you yeah. use quite a lot the the first one actually that really intrigues me is the, sh the principle of shuhari is it? yes shuhari shuhari yeah it's an interesting thing so my chief of staff is Japanese or half Japanese and shuhari are the three stages one goes through to become an expert in anything so shu learn the law obey it 100% Ha, break the law, and then re, which is make the law. And I think if I look back at my career, you know, for the first 10 years, all I was doing was learning the law, learning how to swim. You know, uh, no coach ever wants to have a rebel in the team causing trouble in the lanes, saying, no, I don't feel like doing this, and it ripples through the whole team. You need to go there listening to the coach, learning the law. And at the same time as learning how to swim and how to try to make a, a good stroke, I was actually at law school. The next stage, which was the shu ha, which was break the law, that came naturally to me. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it. It was a time also when I was serving in the British Army and it was a time when I was prepared to push things and now I started to swim in places where people had said these were absolutely impossible. They said it was impossible to swim at the North Pole and I was able to, you know, to go there and to do it. And then I think for the last, 10 years it's actually been making laws so swimming the way I want to swim and uh, and actually making making laws so when we were able to get the Ross Sea protected the Ross Sea marine protected area is 1.5 million square kilometers that's the size of Britain France Germany Italy all put together it's amazing and so that was a really really uh, an amazing moment when that when that got declared but the interesting thing about shuhari is it's just an endless cycle because once you get to the end of that <laughs> then you realize the world has changed a lot and now you have to learn a whole new set of skills and then start the whole process over again a very interesting observation i think you know um first of all what an achievement with the ross sea yeah but, but also that cognizance that you need to go back and start again yes a lot of people i think maybe if they manage to get through the three processes often then i, I sense stop so, yes so that that awareness is a remarkable so is that that persistence i don't know where that comes from but is that what's led to your continued campaigns then because you've you've got bigger and bigger yes. aspirations for the oceans so I always want every swim to be a little bit bigger, a little bit harder, a little bit tougher than the previous one, and hopefully a message which can drive change, you know, and get action going. So my next big swim is uh, is going to be uh, over a coral reef. You know, I think coral reefs are what we should be talking about now. Uh, I like to talk about fire and ice, you know. Uh, uh, ice and coral are, for me, the uh, the ground zeros of the climate crisis. You can see it so visibly. Go to a Lulasat and you see that glacier just breaking away and pouring icebergs out to sea. I was there last year and I saw a mass carving and I've never seen anything like it before. 
literally thousands and thousands and thousands of icebergs pouring out to sea. You go to coral reefs and they are beautiful and they are amazing. You know, they are the, the nurseries of our oceans. A quarter of life in our oceans lives in our nurseries. And when the water temperature rises, they die and you can see it so visibly. And so this next big swim is to be able to tell this story about ice and coral. I want each swim, each campaign to be a little bit harder, a little bit tougher than the next. And I've got to keep on learning, I've got to understand about coral reefs and, and, and how important they are for our environment. Absolutely. So it, this is, is this all part of the build up to this campaign to protect at least 30% of so the world's oceans? Yes. And to protect the important parts. I mean, you could find any part of the world's ocean and just protect it if you wanted to. But it's important that we protect the most biodiverse parts of the oceans. And you start thinking some of the coral reefs, which are around the temperate regions of the world, and how much life they hold. It's really important that, that we focus on coral reefs now, as well as keeping a constant eye and a constant voice from, from the polar regions. Yeah. So, I mean, so how, how close are we to 30%? Are we nowhere near uh, uh, it depends on, on, on whether you ask government or whether you ask NGO communities. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you were to ask the UK government how much of, of the waters around the United Kingdom have you protected, and they'll say somewhere close to 40%. If you ask the NGO community, they will say that there are just seven square kilometers of UK waters that are fully protected. So no drilling for oil, no drilling for gas, no great big industrial fishing fleets taking the fish, no naval exercises with gunnery uh, exercises which you know disturb the environment so much just seven square kilometers it, it our marine protected areas have got to be large and they've got to be properly protected uh, so i think we have an awful long way to go one of the things i've come across is people don't really understand some of the threats as much as they think they do. Yes. So yes, there's absolutely a vital role in drawing attention. You've done that extremely successfully. Yeah. Um, you know, do we need to do more to sort of point people at some of the solutions as well? And yes. Is there yes. enough onus on that? Because I think there's a lot of confusion as to what people think they're meant to do or should be doing next. Yes, and sometimes they're conflicting. Yeah, you know, I, it's education, education, education. We can't expect people to protect the environment if they don't understand what the threats are and what they can do to solve it. And we've got to make it simple. You know, people are busy, they're, they're leading their lives. Obviously it starts at schools, but it seems to me that, you know, if we're gonna solve the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the, how much plastic pollution there is in, in the world, we've got to educate and we've got to do it in a way which is not patronizing and in a way which is really, really simple. I say to people that every single purchase which we make on a daily basis is a decision about our future and it's a decision about our children's future and so whether it be the food which we eat the clothes which we wear how we get our children to school how we get ourselves to work how we heat or cool our homes every single one of those is a decision and we've got to educate people about what are the most environmentally friendly solutions and which are really damaging the environment I don't know anybody that wants to actively damage the environment. People want to protect the environment, okay? But we just have to be able to tell them in a way which is, which they can understand in their busy lives. You've talked about, um, with climate change, obviously coral reefs and glaciers, you've seen very active mm. change in front of your eyes. I know there are other concerns that you have as well around this. One of them is overfishing. Yes. Have you sort of have got examples where you've witnessed that on your swims or in your, uh, your uh -huh. travels? I remember as a young boy, so I spent some of my childhood growing up in Malta, in the middle of the Mediterranean. And one of the memories I have is being at home. I'm young, I think I was about five, six years old, and listening to fish sellers coming past our house, shouting Lampuki, 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 which is a type of, of uh, fish. You go to the Mediterranean now. I mean, it is in a desperate situation. It has been so overfished. Um, let me give you another example. I grew up in Cape Town. My first big swim was from Robben Island back to Cape Town. I remember standing on the beach on Robben Island about to start the swim, and to my left-hand side, 
the whole beach was full of these beautiful African penguins. And I just love African penguins. I love all penguins, but African penguins I especially love. They're so robust and they're so strong and they're so noisy. And the noise of all these penguins, you know, was, you know, I remember it still to this day. I start, there were, there were thousands and I started to swim. I swam back to Cape Town and I went back there uh, a couple of years ago uh, with a Sky News team and we saw three penguins, three penguins. And what is the cause of this been? Three things again. It's these big three which are impacting our oceans. So it's serious overfishing. Fishing companies coming along and catching fish right next to penguin colonies. No wonder their numbers have plummeted. The second thing is climate change. So prey species are moving further away. And then lastly, pollution. Uh, not so much plastic pollution, but you can get an oil spill and it can wipe out a whole penguin colony. So these three things, you know, over the past 35 years I've witnessed. I can't help pulling up the fact that you love all penguins. I, 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 I understood one of them trying to take your eye out. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes get asked to do sort of photo shoots for a, uh, a charity in Cape Town which cleans oiled penguins. And I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing that is more desperate to see than a penguin coming ashore and it has got oil caked all over it and it is choking. And penguins don't like being cleaned. They don't like having oil on themselves, but they also don't like being cleaned. And it's a really, really tough job. And it's an expensive job. And so these, this charity has to raise money. And so sometimes I'm asked there to go and do a photo shoot with some of the penguins. Anyway, I, I picked up one of these African penguins and I wasn't switched on and it literally, it turned and it latched onto my lip here and it, the cut, I mean, I was lucky that it didn't get my eye, but it just gave a really big cut down there. And so I gently put, put it down and I picked up a more friendly penguin and carried on with the photo shoot. Uh, but you gotta be, they do not like, <laughs> they do not like oil and they do not like photo shoots. The other, the other one I was just going to very quickly touch on then is pollution. I mean, obviously you've seen yeah. the consequences of oil pollution, but I assume also you've oh. seen evidence of some of the plastics that people are so concerned about in the ocean. Yeah. So are there examples there where it stand out that you've mm. witnessed yourself? Or? I mean, the big standout would be Mumbai. I mean, it's astonishing. There's a beach there called Fasova Beach, which is right next to Bollywood. I mean, it's about a kilometer away from Bollywood. And there's a big informal settlement on the beach there. I mean, shanty town uh, with over a million people there. And on the beach, when they started this beach cleanup a, a few years ago, the plastic pollution was literally up to the shoulders. Wow. Up to the shoulders. When I went there, and I went there, I think in about week 50, there was a young uh, Indian barrister called Afro Shah, the most inspirational person I have met. And, you know, he has a small flat, it overlooks for Sova Beach. And the one day he said, I'm just not going to accept this. So the Mumbai Municipal Council just wasn't doing a clean up there. So he decided to go to his next door neighbor. He knocked on the next door neighbor's door and he said, please come and help me clean it. And they went down there and they just cleaned a tiny little patch. And then the next week it was four people and then six people and then eight people. And then, I mean, now every single weekend they get, you know, sometimes a thousand, two thousand people cleaning this beach. And I went there and it was amazing because we brought in trucks, we brought in bulldozers, we brought in lorries. We cleaned that beach until finally we could see the sand underneath our feet. The tragedy is, go back there the next Wednesday and the ocean has vomited up more and more and more plastic. So it's a full-time job. Uh, that beach cleanup now has been going on for over six years. Uh, but they need to s s end it at source. And so uh, Afro Shah leads this group of volunteers who not only clean the beach, they speak to businesses, they're trying to ensure that people are not using single-use plastic. Uh, but you look at some of the rivers in, you know, around the world, we've got to stop plastic getting into, into rivers. Because if it gets into the river, then it obviously gets into the ocean. And so it's also, you know, a question of ensuring that there's good waste disposal. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I was going to ask you how you would sort of offer 
Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of noise and a lot of media around mm. some of the threats that we all face. Yes. How would you offer sort of hope and, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know really, hope, yeah, probably, to yeah. young people concerned yeah. with all of the change that they witness? Yeah. Uh, hope is a dangerous word. Because it le can lead to an abdication of responsibility because you hope that some other person is going to solve these crises. You hope that some other government is going to cut its carbon emissions. You hope that some other company is going to stop polluting the environment. You hope that somebody's going to come up with a technical solution. We've got to earn hope. We've got to take action every single day. And so my message to, to people is, please wake up every single morning and ask yourself a very, very simple question. And that is, what steps can I take today to help solve these environmental crises, and then please dive in and take them. Then I have hope. So action over hope. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I can't let you go without talking about it, mm. is is very much Lewis on Lewis. So uh, when you when you came up um, a few years ago, yeah. you were looking to do some training. Yeah. I know you went out to the Western Isles and. Yeah did some training there and I wondered if yeah. you could just tell us a bit about that and your experiences there. So. Oh, it was amazing because I was going to go do a swim down in Antarctica and so I wanted a place to train and so the swim was going to be in January so where do you go and train where it's going to be really cold? Well, the Isle of Lewis was the obvious idea and then I took out a, a little advert in the newspaper and I said, I'm looking for a training partner, uh, you know, hard training, please no grumbling, no cups of tea, no hogemony. And you simply cannot believe how many volunteers. Anyway, I chose one person, but then I decided to open it up to the public. And we must have had about 50 people coming up there from around the island and some of them from mainland Scotland to come and train. And they were the toughest people I have ever met. There was this whole community of cold water swimmers that I didn't even know about who just train up there quietly every single day on the Isle of Lewis. It was the best training. I got down to Antarctica and it was actually quite easy <laughs> because I trained on the Isle of Lewis. In January, was in, it January? It was January, yeah. yeah. It started just, it was between Christmas and maybe the, the end of the first week of January. It must have been so heartening to sort of turn up and there's 50 people waiting to get in the water. It was astonishing, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. Okay, what a great place to finish. Look, Lewis, thank you so much. Honestly, it's an absolute privilege and, uh, and, and good luck in everything that you do. So. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.